Michaelis, the ticket-of-leave apostle, smiled vaguely with his glued lips. His pasty moon face drooped under the weight of a melancholy ascent. He had been a prisoner himself. His own skin had sizzled under the red-hot brand, he murmured softly. But Comrade Ossipon, nicknamed the doctor, had got over the shock by that time. You don't understand, he began disdainfully, but stopped short, intimidated by the dread blackness of the cavernous eyes and the face turned slowly towards him with a blind stare, as if guided only by the sound. He gave the discussion up with a slight shrug of the shoulders. Stevie, accustomed to move about disregarded, had got up from the kitchen table, carrying off his drawing to bed with him. He had reached the parlor door in time to receive in full the shock of Carl Jung's eloquent imagery. The sheet of paper covered with circles dropped out of his fingers, and he remained staring at the old terrorist, as if rooted suddenly to the spot by his morbid horror and dread of physical pain. Stevie knew very well that hot iron applied to one's skin hurt very much. His scared eyes blazed with indignation. It would hurt terribly. His mouth dropped open. Michaelis, by staring unwinkingly at the fire, had regained the sentiment of isolation necessary for the continuity of his thought. His optimism had begun to flow from his lips. He saw capitalism doomed in its cradle, born with the poison of the principle of competition in its system. The great capitalists devouring little capitalists, concentrating the power and the tools of production in great masses, perfecting industrial processes, and in the madness of self-aggrandizement, only preparing, organizing, enriching, making ready the lawful inheritance of the suffering proletariat. Michaelis pronounced the great word patience, and his clear blue glance, raised to the low ceiling of Mr. Verloc's parlor, had a character of a seraphic trustfulness. In the doorway, Stevie, calmed, seemed sunk in hebitude. Comrade Ossipan's face twitched with exasperation. Then it's no use doing anything, no use whatever. I don't say that, protested Michaelis gently. His vision of truth had grown so intense that the sound of a strange voice failed to rout it this time. He continued to look down at the red coals. Preparation for the future was necessary, and he was willing to admit that the great change would perhaps come up in the upheaval of a revolution. But he argued that revolutionary propaganda was a delicate work of high conscience. It was the education of the masters of the world. It should be as careful as the education given to kings. He would have it advance its tenets, cautiously, even timidly, in our ignorance of the effect that may be produced by any given economic change upon the happiness, the morals, the intellect, the history of mankind. For history is made with tools, not with ideas, and everything is changed by economic conditions. Art, philosophy, love, virtue, life itself, truth itself. The coals in the grate settled down with a slight crash, and Michaelis, the hermit of visions and the desert of a penitentiary, got up impatiently. Round, like a distended balloon, he opened his short, thick arms, as if 
in a pathetically hopeless attempt to embrace and hug to his breast a self-regenerated universe. He gasped with ardor. The future is as certain as the past. Slavery, feudalism, individualism, collectivism. This is the statement of a law, not an empty prophecy. The disdainful pout of Comrade Ossipin's thick lips accentuated the negro type of his face. Nonsense, he said calmly enough. There is no law and no certainty. The teaching propaganda be hanged. What the people know does not matter, were its knowledge ever so accurate. The only thing that matters to us is the emotional state of the masses. Without emotion, there is no action. He paused, then added with modest firmness, I am speaking now to you scientifically. Scientifically, eh? What did you say, Verloc? Nothing, growled from the sofa, Mr. Verloc, who, provoked by the abhorrent sound, had merely muttered a damn. The venomous spluttering of the old terrorist without teeth was heard. Do you know how I would call the nature of the present economic conditions? I would call it cannibalistic. That's what it is. They are nourishing their greed on the quivering flesh and the warm blood of the people, nothing else. Stevie swallowed the terrifying statement with an audible gulp, and at once, as though it had been swift poison, sank limply in a sitting position on the steps of the kitchen door. Michaelis gave no sign of having heard anything. His lips seemed glued together for good. Not a quiver passed over his heavy cheeks. With troubled eyes, he looked for his round, hard hat and put it on his round head. His round and obese body seemed to float low between the chairs under the sharp elbow of Carl Junt. The old terrorist, raising an uncertain and claw-like hand, gave a swaggering tilt to a black felt sombrero, shading the hollows and ridges of his wasted face. He got in motion slowly, striking the floor with his stick at every step. It was rather an affair to get himself out of the house, because, now and then, he would stop, as if to think, and did not offer to move again, till impelled forward by Michaelis. The gentle apostle grasped his arm with brotherly care, and behind them, his hands in his pockets, the robust Osipan yawned vaguely. A blue cap with a patent leather peak, set well at the back of his yellow bush of hair, gave him the aspect of a Norwegian sailor, bored with the world after a thundering spree. Mr. Verloc saw his guests off the premises, attending them bareheaded, his heavy overcoat hanging open, his eyes on the ground. He closed the door behind their backs with restrained violence, turned the key, shot the bolt. He was not satisfied with his friends. In the light of Mr. Vladimir's philosophy of bomb-throwing, they appeared hopelessly futile. The part of Mr. Verloc in revolutionary politics having been to observe. He could not all at once, either in his own home or in larger assemblies, take the initiative of action. He had to be cautious. Moved by the just indignation of a man well over forty, menaced in what is dearest to him, his repose and his security, he asked himself scornfully what else could have been expected from such a lot. This Karl Junt, this Michaelis, this Ossipan. Pausing in his intention to turn off the gas burning in the middle of the shop, Mr. Verloc descended into the abyss of moral reflections. With the insight of a kindred temperament, 
He pronounced his verdict. A lazy lot, this Carl Junt, nursed by a blear-eyed old woman, a woman he had years ago enticed away from a friend, and afterwards had tried more than once to shake off into the gutter. Jolly lucky for Yunt that she had persisted in coming up time after time, or else there would have been no one now to help him out of the bus by the Green Park railings, where that specter took its constitutional crawl every fine morning. When that indomitable, snarling old witch died, the swaggering specter would have to vanish too. There would be an end to fiery Carl Junt, and Mr. Verloc's morality was offended also by the optimism of Michaelis, annexed by his wealthy old lady, who had taken lately to sending him to a cottage she had in the country. The ex-prisoner could moon about the shady lanes for days together in a delicious and humanitarian idleness. As to Ossipan, that beggar was sure to want for nothing as long as there were silly girls with savings bank books in the world. And Mr. Verloc, temperamentally identical with his associates, drew fine distinctions in his mind on the strength of insignificant differences. He drew them with a certain complacency, because the instinct of conventional respectability was strong within him, being only overcome by his dislike of all kinds of recognized labor, a temperamental defect which he shared with a large proportion of revolutionary reformers of a given social state. For obviously, one does not revolt against the advantages and opportunities of that state, but against the price which must be paid for the same in the coin of accepted morality, self-restraint, and toil. The majority of revolutionists are the enemies of discipline and fatigue mostly. They are natures, too, to whose sense of justice the price exacted looms up monstrously, enormous, odious, oppressive, worrying, humiliating, extortionate, intolerable. Those are the fanatics. The remaining portion of social rebels is accounted for by vanity, the mother of all noble and vile illusions, the companion of poets, reformers, charlatans, prophets, and incendiaries. Lost for a whole minute in the abyss of meditation, Mr. Verloc did not reach the depth of these abstract considerations. Perhaps he was not able. In any case, he had not the time. He was pulled up painfully by the sudden recollection of Mr. Vladimir, another of his associates, whom, in virtue of subtle moral affinities, he was capable of judging correctly. He considered him as dangerous. A shade of envy crept into his thoughts. Loafing was all very well for these fellows, who knew not Mr. Vladimir, and had women to fall back upon, whereas he had a woman to provide for. At this point, by a simple association of ideas, Mr. Verloc was brought face to face with the necessity of going to bed some time or other that evening. Then why not go now? At once, he sighed. The necessity was not so normally pleasurable as it ought to have been for a man of his age and temperament. He dreaded the demon of sleeplessness, which he felt had marked him for its own. He raised his arm and turned off the flaring gas jet above his head. A bright band of light fell through the parlor door into the part of the shop behind the counter. It enabled Mr. Verloc to ascertain, at a glance, the number of silver coins in the till. These were but few, and for the first time since he opened his shop, 
he took a commercial survey of its value. The survey was unfavorable. He had gone into trade for no commercial reasons. He had been guided in the selection of this peculiar line of business by an instinct leaning towards shady transactions where money is picked up easily. Moreover, it did not take him out of his own sphere, the sphere which is watched by the police. On the contrary, it gave him a publicly confessed standing in that sphere, and as Mr. Verloc had unconfessed relations which made him familiar with yet careless of the police, there was a distinct advantage in such a situation. But as a means of livelihood, it was by itself insufficient. He took the cash box out of the drawer and, turning to leave the shop, became aware that Stevie was still downstairs. What on earth is he doing there? Mr. Verloc asked himself. What's the meaning of these antics? He looked dubiously at his brother-in-law, but he did not ask him for information. Mr. Verloc's intercourse with Stevie was limited to the casual mutter of a morning after breakfast, my boots, and even that was more a communication at large of a need than a direct order or request. Mr. Verloc perceived with some surprise that he did not know really what to say to Stevie. He stood still in the middle of the parlor and looked into the kitchen in silence. Nor yet did he know what would happen if he did say anything, and this appeared very queer to Mr. Verloc in view of the fact, borne upon him suddenly, that he had to provide for this fellow too. He had never given a moment's thought till then to that aspect of Stevie's existence. Positively, he did not know how to speak to the lad. He watched him gesticulating and murmuring in the kitchen. Stevie prowled round the table like an excited animal in a cage. A tentative, hadn't you better go to bed now, produced no effect whatever. And Mr. Verloc, abandoning the stony contemplation of his brother-in-law's behavior, crossed the parlor wearily, cash box in hand. The cause of the general lassitude he felt while climbing the stairs, being purely mental, he became alarmed by its inexplicable character. He hoped he was not sickening for anything. He stopped on the dark landing to examine his sensations. But a slight and continuous sound of snoring pervading the obscurity interfered with their clearness. The sound came from his mother-in-law's room. Another one to provide for, he thought, and on this thought walked into the bedroom. Mrs. Verloc had fallen asleep with the lamp. No gas was laid upstairs, turned up full on the table by the side of the bed. The light thrown down by the shade fell dazzlingly on the white pillow sunk by the weight of her head, reposing with closed eyes and dark hair, done up in several plates for the night. She woke up with the sound of her name in her ears and saw her husband standing over her. Winnie, Winnie. At first she did not stir, lying very quiet and looking at the cash box in Mr. Verloc's hand. But when she understood that her brother was capering all over the place downstairs, she swung out in one sudden movement onto the edge of the bed. Her bare feet, as if poked through the bottom of an unadorned sleeved calico sack, buttoned tightly at neck and wrists, felt over the rug for the slippers while she looked upward into her husband's face. I don't know how to manage him, Mr. Verloc explained peevishly. Won't do to leave him downstairs alone with the lights. She said nothing, glided across the room swiftly, and the door closed behind her white form. Mr. Verloc deposited the cash box on the night table and began the operation of undressing 
by flinging his overcoat onto a distant chair. His coat and waistcoat followed. He walked about the room in his stockinged feet, and his burly figure, with the hands worrying nervously at his throat, passed and repassed across the long strip of looking-glass and the door of his wife's wardrobe. Then, after slipping his braces off his shoulders, he pulled up violently the Venetian blind and leaned his forehead against the cold window pane. A fragile film of glass stretched between him and the enormity of cold, black, wet, muddy, inhospitable accumulation of bricks, slates, and stones, things in themselves unlovely and unfriendly to man. Mr. Verloc felt the latent unfriendliness of all out-of-doors with a force approaching to positive bodily anguish. There is no occupation that fails a man more completely than that of a secret agent of police. It's like your horse suddenly falling dead under you in the midst of an uninhabited and thirsty plain. The comparison occurred to Mr. Verloc because he had sat astride of various army horses in his time and had now the sensation of an incipient fall. The prospect was as black as the window pane against which he was leaning his forehead, and suddenly the face of Mr. Vladimir, clean-shaved and witty, appeared and hallowed in the glow of its rosy complexion, like a sort of pink seal impressed on the fatal darkness. This luminous and mutilated vision was so ghastly physically that Mr. Verloc started away from the window, letting down the Venetian blind with a great rattle. Discomposed and speechless with the apprehension of more such visions, he beheld his wife re-enter the room and get into bed in a calm, business-like manner, which made him feel hopelessly lonely in the world. Mrs. Verloc expressed her surprise at seeing him up yet. I don't feel very well, he muttered, passing his hand over his moist brow. Giddiness? Yes, not at all well. Mrs. Verloc, with all the placidity of an experienced wife, expressed a confident opinion as to the cause, and suggested the usual remedies. But her husband, rooted in the middle of the room, shook his lowered head sadly. You'll catch cold standing there, she observed. Mr. Verloc made an effort, finished undressing, and got into bed. Down below, in the quiet, narrow street, measured footsteps approached the house, then died away, unhurried and firm, as if the passer-by had started to pace out all eternity, from gas lamp to gas lamp, in a night without end, and the drowsy ticking of the old clock on the landing became distinctly audible in the bedroom. Mrs. Verloc, on her back and staring at the ceiling, made a remark. Taking's very small today. Mr. Verloc, in the same position, cleared his throat, as if for an important statement, but merely inquired, Did you turn off the gas downstairs? Yes, I did, answered Mrs. Verloc, conscientiously. That poor boy is in a very excited state tonight. She murmured, after a pause, which lasted for three ticks of the clock. Mr. Verloc cared nothing for Stevie's excitement, but he felt horribly wakeful and dreaded facing the darkness and silence that would follow the extinguishing of the lamp. This dread led him to make the remark that Stevie had disregarded his suggestion to go to bed. Mrs. Verloc, falling into the trap, started to demonstrate at length to her husband that this was not impudence of any sort, but simply excitement. There was no young man of his age in London more willing and docile than Stephen, she affirmed. 
none more affectionate and ready to please, and even useful, as long as people did not upset his poor head. Mrs. Verloc, turning towards her recumbent husband, raised herself on her elbow, and hung over him in her anxiety that he should believe Stevie to be a useful member of the family. That ardor of protecting compassion, exalted morbidly in her childhood by the misery of another child, tinged her sallow cheeks with a faint, dusky blush, made her big eyes gleam under the dark lids. Mrs. Verloc then looked younger. She looked as young as Winnie used to look, and much more animated than Winnie of the Belgravian mansion. Days had ever allowed herself to appear to gentlemen lodgers. Mr. Verloc's anxieties had prevented him from attaching any sense to what his wife was saying. It was as if her voice were talking on the other side of a very thick wall. It was her aspect that recalled him to himself. He appreciated this woman, and the sentiment of this appreciation, stirred by a display of something resembling emotion, only added another pang to his mental anguish. When her voice ceased, he moved uneasily and said, I haven't been feeling well for the last few days. He might have meant this as an opening to a complete confidence, but Mrs. Verloc laid her head on the pillow again and staring upward went on. That boy hears too much of what is talked about here. If I had known they were coming tonight, I would have seen to it that he went to bed at the same time I did. He was out of his mind with something he overheard about eating people's flesh and drinking blood. What's the good of talking like that? There was a note of indignant scorn in her voice. Mr. Verloc was fully responsive now. Ask Carl Yunt, he growled savagely. Mrs. Verloc, with great decision, pronounced Carl Yunt a disgusting old man. She declared openly her affection for Michaelis, of the robust Osipan, in whose presence she always felt uneasy, but behind an attitude of stony reserve, she said nothing whatever, and continued to talk of that brother who had been for so many years an object of care and fears. He isn't fit to hear what's said here. He believes it's all true. He knows no better. He gets into his passions over it. Mr. Verloc made no comment. He glared at me as if he didn't know who I was. When I went upstairs, his heart was going like a hammer. He can't help being excitable. I woke Mother up and asked her to sit with him till he went to sleep. It isn't his fault. He's no trouble when he's left alone. Mr. Verloc made no comment. I wish he had never been to school, Mrs. Verloc began again, brusquely. He's always taking away those newspapers from the window to read. He gets a red face pouring over them. We don't get rid of a dozen numbers in a month. They only take up room in the front window. And Mr. Ossipan brings every week a pile of these FP tracks to sell at a halfpenny each. I wouldn't give a halfpenny for the whole lot. It's silly reading. That's what it is. There is no sale for it. The other day Stevie got hold of one and there was a story in it of a German soldier officer tearing half off the ear of a recruit, and nothing was done to him for it. The brute. I couldn't do anything with Stevie that afternoon. The story was enough, too, to make one's blood boil. But what's the use of printing things like that? We aren't German slaves here, thank God. It's not our business, is it? Mr. Verloc made no reply. 
I had to take the carving knife from the boy, Mrs. Verloc continued, a little sleepily now. He was shouting and stamping and sobbing. He can't stand the notion of any cruelty. He would have stuck that officer like a pig if he had seen him then. It's true, too. Some people don't deserve much mercy. Mrs. Verloc's voice ceased, and the expression of her motionless eyes became more and more contemplated and veiled during the long pause. Comfortable, dear? she asked in a faint, faraway voice. Shall I put out the light now? The dreary conviction that there was no sleep for him held Mr. Verloc mute and hopelessly inert in his fear of darkness. He made a great effort. Yes, put it out, he said at last in a hollow tone.